go. Get ready, get set for the best movie and pop culture talk in the universe. It's the Good Brothers on Mercado Airwaves with your hosts, Alex Mercado and Mike Mercado. Welcome back to another episode of the Good Brothers. I'm Alex. That's Mike. We are the Good Brothers. We are the highway men from New York to L.A. We are the best brothers, some would say. Talking everything pop culture. Say hi to the folks, Mike. Hi, folks, Mike. How you doing, good brother? I'm doing great, man. I'm excited for next week. It feels like the week before a big fight. Yeah, absolutely, as next week we get ready for Mortal Kombat to finally hit the airwaves, but we've had a busy week already, so before we get to everything, we hope each and every one of you is being safe and sound, thank you so much for making us a part of your day, here on the Good Brothers, your highwaymen between LA and New York City, here on Mercado Airwaves, Good Brother, should we start off, if we're gonna be theming of combat and fighting and glory, we need to start off with A whole week of WrestleMania. We also got to get into Falcon and the Winter Soldier and so much more. But we head into the squared circle. Good brother, your thoughts of what was a long week of NXT TakeOver, AEW, WrestleMania week. How did you enjoy just binging a bunch of wrestling? I enjoyed most of it, honestly. And I really enjoyed Saturday night. I think there was nothing really that can be done wrong Saturday because of the way it was set up and because it was your first initial pop. I had a big issue with Sunday. Definitely was more of a a lull. Definitely didn't feel like a WrestleMania. And going by Monday, you start to notice, well, this was kind of a blip because now we're kind of going back into, you know, the Thunderdome and kind of, I feel like they're prolonging a lot of big storylines still until they know for sure we can be in front of people consistently. And they've come out and said, you know, the next time you see a crowd, we're going to be in a crowd from then on. Like, WrestleMania was a bit of an exception. So hopefully SummerSlam is the next go in front of people, and then the following Monday in front of people, and then from then on, we're a live audience. What would you say was your favorite part, and what was your favorite match of the weekend? Uh, it has to be Bianca and Sasha, right? I think that was the best match of the weekend. I think that was the best match of the week beside Walter and Ciampa, but obviously because this main event at a WrestleMania, I'm going to give it to Bianca and Sasha. I thought it was a great match. I love the old school Mark Henry power of lifting her and throwing her back in the ring, the whips, the way it ended, the pop, the emotion before. It was almost a perfect match, if I would say. I think for me, it comes down to three matches through the weekend. We have Ciampa versus Walter. I think that one was an instant classic for so many different reasons. Night one, you have Sasha versus Bianca. Obviously, the history, the the work rate was amazing, and the atmosphere was fantastic. But I also think that it's getting snoozed on a little bit, but that main event between Roman Reigns, Edge, and Daniel Bryan was a banger. Obviously, there was a lot of gaga in the match, but we knew that was going to be the case in a three-way match. With that being said, it was a predictable WrestleMania in some parts. I mean, when we see that Drew McIntyre comes out first, we all kind of had that theory that he was going to, that was going to be his reward, was getting the first pop of the night. But even then, it was a little weird. I will say one of the biggest drawbacks and one of my biggest critiques to the the whole WrestleMania aesthetic was that initial pop of the night. When you were doing, it's one thing for Vince McMahon to kind of get that first pop, be the first person on the mic. But I think it took a long time for us to finally get to Drew McIntyre's entry. Even with the rather delay, which was really cool. You know, as Cub fans... I'm all for the drama, and why not wait another few minutes to get to what we've been waiting for so long? But I think to have Hulk Hogan and Titus, shout out to Titus O'Neil, one of the nicest dudes in the industry. But with that, like, I, I think it was a little bit wasted if you kind of get where my one little nitpick of an amazing kind of ceremony where it just took us a long time to get to Drew finally having his moment when if we were going to have this weather delay, we needed to just get to that point. Do you think, like, here's my next question, because I think the Hogan thing all week was very tone deaf. Do you think at this point Hogan, as a host, let's say, not not just a legend, I think he'll always be a legend or always going to be in the audience for that, but, like, in these big hosting situations that doesn't include Saudi Arabia, do you think his time is kind of up in that, where, like, this newer generation really doesn't connect to Hulk Hogan, and all they really know him for now is the drama instead of, at least you and me can hang on to, well, end up low school. I'll give Hogan a pop when I see him. I don't necessarily think I need to hear him anymore, though, or 
get him for my TV for that long of a time. I think it's a little bit of both. I think this is it's a very nuanced conversation because we can say that we don't like Terry Bollea or we don't like the Terry Bollea that has finally come to surface because he's, you know, the, the media changed and social media changed and we're finally able to see the man behind Hulk Hogan. With that, if you're a fan of wrestling pop culture from the 80s and 90s, you do have that clouded judgment of Hulk Hogan and Terry Bollea. With the WWE aspect of it, because I could forgive the fans for nostalgia, you know, for, for being able to separate the art from the artist, but, but WWE, I think it's much more of a business thing where they're, they need to make value off of the contract they gave them. It's one of the guys they don't want to see on TNT. I don't think Vince necessarily cares about AEW, and we saw that with the Jericho thing, but I do think there is some value to Hulk Hogan going back to TNT that he doesn't want them to necessarily have. He doesn't want that on their library, I think, so... Until kind of that day happens where there's nowhere for Hogan to go, I think they're going to try to utilize and, and kind of get those NBC brokers or those Fox brokers to have that one hit pop. But yeah, I think long term wise, yeah, this this was definitely a, a eye opener. I think for WWE to realize, like, yeah, you know, I think I think that has kind of gone to his pasture. Maybe it's time to see if we could find the the John Cena of that generation. Who is that guy from that era that you can bring back to kind of be a spokesperson for this new generation of people? I think it's Stone Cold, honestly, and I think it could be certain transition that where he's getting the special nights and he's getting the birthday celebrations and. You know, I think that's when we can all get behind because like a normal famous person, let's say, he definitely has every famous person has their baggage because their life is out there. Yeah. But I think Stone Cold's one where ESPN can get involved. A younger generation knows it from just the flicking off, the beer drinking, the 316. I think that's still enough in the zeitgeist where all generations can get behind. Oh, Stone Cold. We all love Stone Cold. Like, who doesn't love Stone Cold? As we're Hulk Hogan, now you get to the conversation of, man, do I really need to see Hulk Hogan right now? Even the fans are starting to say that a little bit. Yeah, so I think there was a lot of stuff that happened this weekend that WWE learned, and I think there was, so I think they were waiting to kind of see how a lot of the pops were going to go, what the emotion was, but I also think we might have overstated what maybe they're, they were going to be after it, because they, they're right back to the Thunderdome, and I don't know when arenas are going to be open for them, because what we got to remember too is, they're not a, they're not the Chicago Cubs, they're not the Bears, the Bulls, where they have a home location, and the team that they're going against has a home location. The WWE is a traveling entertainment show, so they're going to go city to city, arena to arena, and in this day and age right now, no matter where your political view is, whatever, that's just not logistically possible right now in the age of COVID. So I wonder what the, the future is heading into maybe even SummerSlam. Do you think we're, they're going to do everything they can to get a crowd into that August arena? Yeah, I believe so, and I do think that's where we're leading, is that we will have, and by August, September, we will have fans in the stadium on a more consistent basis, at least enough for them to be traveling to certain parts. Do I think everyone will be the same? Obviously not, but I think there might be enough by August, by end of summer, for us to have a traveling WWE to certain areas. So now that we're kind of out of WrestleMania season and we're building into SummerSlam season and, you know, we all know that this is kind of the uh, the low period is as we get to SummerSlam that there's not going to be that much great WWE television. I, for one, I understand because of the, the COVID situation and where we're at the night after Raw, the night after uh, uh, WrestleMania on Monday Night Raw, usually a big event. I I never got my hopes up just because of where we're at right now. What were your thoughts about Monday Night Raw and now Friday Night SmackDown post-WrestleMania? I mean, it just didn't feel like it after WrestleMania. And I think, like, you were smart enough not to get your hopes up. I feel like they did advertise it quite a bit, though. Yeah. So I was mm -hmm. like, maybe we'll get a Thunderdome version. Because I feel like even last year, it was it felt like last year was after WrestleMania. Where, like, it was just another Raw. And in fact, mm -hmm. it might have been a worse Raw because they really didn't continue anything because we have backlash coming up, you know, you got the War Raiders back, but at the same time, we saw them on stage. So that kind of blew the surprise a little bit that we knew they'd be appearing at some point over the weekend because they're out there during the National Anthem or America the Beautiful. 
Yeah, and I think we have to, until we're back to some form of normalcy where they're traveling, I think that's the big thing, until they're traveling again, because even if they are allowed X amount of people in their performance center or wherever, they go back to full sale, wherever the case may be, they're able to get people into, uh, I think they're in South Florida University right now, that they can yeah. start letting people in, maybe, maybe they'll start doing that, but this is the thing though, even with those fans coming in that ends up being the nxt audience where it's just the same people coming over and over again and every once in a while you have people traveling to see your show but i don't think that's a gauge for them to see what the audience in london chicago new york los angeles houston mexico brazil is actually feeling you know besides youtube and social media so i'm really fascinated to see how that's gonna play out no yeah i agree and you know obviously we have you know they, what is it, Black Wednesday they're calling it now yes. at this time last year. And it seems to me this will be the pattern going forward every year of when they start budget cutting, quote unquote, and releasing some of these wrestlers. There are some that, like Samoa Joe and Mickey James, where we put for more, we're not cleared. So, like, we're going to go get cleared somewhere else. Almost a Daniel Bryan path that he almost had to take in the alternate universe. Mm-hmm. There are some like the Iconics and Mojo, which were, we don't have anything for you. So, it's always a sad time. It's a very odd time because we're normally we feel very pumped and hyped from after WrestleMania. It kind of drastically shifted so much. It's hard to kind of get a reaction. And I think the problem is we are so connected to the performers behind the characters now more than ever in wrestling and in sports entertainment. So you you have that you feel like you're connected to them. You're more invested in them. But the truth of the matter is, is it's still a form of sports and entertainment. And as callous as it is. Sometimes people need a change of scenery. Sometimes people need to move on. As the good old JR likes to say, you have to go and learn a new move. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think what sucks is the the optics of a multi-billion dollar corporation that just has these billion dollar deals with NBC Universal and Fox that they're letting people go. But this is the same company that made shrewd business decisions during the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic when they were letting people go. So I'm not, again, I'm maybe just desensitized to them doing that. But with that, at least now, there are so many organizations, so many eyes on different professional wrestling companies. And, you know, you and I are, are, don't lie. We don't front. Is AEW our favorite? No, but we support AEW. We want the performers and the fans to have an outlet for them. We want people who hate AEW to have a a platform to make money critiquing it. This is great for all of us. So I think while in the immediate moment, somebody like Chelsea Green being let go is sad because you're like, damn, we never got to see the potential of how a badass she is. She's going to go land somewhere, and she's going to be badass somewhere else, and maybe life comes full circle. Maybe Samoa Joe comes back in a year or two. Maybe the Iconics come back. They they had their WrestleMania moment. They're in the record books. I think... It, there's you can look at it so many different ways, but at the very least, it's not like the 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 mid two thousands at the WCW and and these other places were let go where it was very small indies that were trying to become big. Now you can make a living, and I think that's really important to also keep in mind. Yeah, I agree with that, but also I think here's the issue, and what Coach brought it up very good is the difference between this and last year. There's two points. One, the indie scene as a lot of it is dead, but yeah. mo- a lot of it is coming back, mm-hmm. so that's good. But here's the bigger issue. Uh, we look at AEW. A lot of these members, let's say 75% of the 10 people on that list, were making very good money, even for not doing much. AEW is very roster heavy at the moment, even with their two YouTube shows and their TNT time. And and it's been you know confirmed by Tony Khan that they're getting a third hour on TNT sometime in the summer. So that's great. But at the end of the day, when people say, well, they'll go to AEW, realistically, you might see one and or two. Maybe three. If I had to guess now, Joe and the Iconics, you'll see an AEW. Other than that, there isn't that option out there because even their roster is a lot of bet. And when is the day going to come where AEW has to clean a little roster? Do we react the same as we do to WWE? You know, that's a really good point, good brother. I think that while I could be optimistic, it doesn't change the fact that 
you know, it, it is still, people are coming back and, and not everything has been able to recover. You know, we're, you know, you and your personal job outside of the Good Brothers and me in the actual industry, not just on the network, but in Chicago media, it's, you're right. Like, while there is a lot of outlets, a lot of outlets were subsidized and, and con- consolidized. So you're a hundred percent right. And, the, and the, the guys over at What Culture bringing up that point, while there may be a lot of logos out there, doesn't mean there's a lot of roster spots right now within these organizations but with that good brother we could talk about this all day and you know we we haven't really had a deep dive conversation on the wrestling industry in a long time I think maybe since last year when these releases happened during the COVID-19 beginning of the pandemic and whatnot but I'm really what are your vibes right now as we move forward we have a lot of fun stuff you know we spent 15-20 minutes talking about this we have some fun stuff that we have to finish off the show with but your final thoughts kind of on your vibes of wrestling right now I think it's in a limbo state and I think that's good and bad, bad in a sense where I think there's not a lot of security, like you Mm -hmm. said, and like you said it perfectly, you being in the industry where a lot of stuff did get combined, a lot of stuff did get taken away and this became this and this is now this and if you were this, now you are this. So that's a little scary thinking like we we all work in fields like that, especially like I work in a sports field, you work in entertainment field. WWE is sports entertainment. So we can definitely vibe with that fear of, well, what does what's my job and what is my job going to be? And are there other options? And then, but the positive is the industry is changing. And I think we're getting a youth movement. I think we'll look back and I think by the middle of this year, end of this year, you can tell with the women's championship and just in general, Bobby Lashley and Apollo Crews, like we're definitely getting a push into the future. And that's exciting. So that's the one positive spin. And AW, as much as we don't love all of it, I do enjoy a lot of it too, though, at the same time. But I'm going to be critical like I am with WWE. I'm not going to suck at the teeth of Tony Khan when he's doing wrong, but I will give praise when he does right, and he does a lot right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think my biggest critique of Tony Khan, and, you know, it's just fair because if we're going to go hard on Vince and then praise Vince, you know, like we said, the good stuff that Tony Khan does, I don't like that Tony Khan always just kind of comes off as uh, almost like Elon Musk where he's always got an answer for everything. I think he's somebody that I still want to see him kind of prove himself. I want to see more diversity in AEW. I don't want to see such random booking, but it's still early. And like we said, it needs to be successful because we want to see our favorite entertainers and and personalities have jobs and create content and show their arts and show their performance and their skills. So I'm with you, good brother, though. Let's uh, let's keep the good vibes for an industry that, just like everybody else during this pandemic in the world we're in, has suffered when it comes to the people you know, that aren't in the corporate offices and aren't making all the big bucks. So with that, good brother, I think it was a, a a really fun deep dive into wrestling after one of our favorite weeks, maybe the second best entertaining week other than Royal Rumble. What would you say as we let go of uh, uh, and we look past this now? Is your favorite season Royal Rumble season or WrestleMania season? I tend to prefer Royal Rumble for the pure fact of you get to enjoy one Royal Rumble is the most fun match because it's just more fun. And we have two of them now. The build to Royal Rumble is fun. And then the Royal Rumble ending is the build to WrestleMania. So I just think, in my opinion, Royal Rumble offers everything. Whereas after WrestleMania, you're kind of left with, well, what now? Where after Royal Rumble, you're like, okay, now let's go. Like, what, what are we doing? Well, good brother, I do know what we're doing. And we have to move on to the MCU We got the latest episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We are so close to the finish line. A a very fun cameo, an appearance of a new world-renowned actress into the MCU. We got our first post-credit scene. Good Brother, your thoughts on the latest episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I mean, every episode just gets so much better. This was my favorite, obviously. I think the action scenes are can't miss. I love the beginning. Like, we start with a fight. Like, we get right into a fight, one-on-two. Obviously, ends a little different than when Captain America and Bucky were fighting two-on-one. A little throwback, I think, a little nod to it. But really excited about it. I. It's just such a – it's not even a slow build, but everything matters. Like, I wouldn't call it slow or fast, but every scene matters. And, again, I hate to say it, but compared to the other MCU show we have, man, this is so much – hands down way better it almost doesn't even feel like the same studio i feel like one belonged on abc family and one belongs on disney plus and i hate burying the show but man this show is so good 
it just, I can't help but think, how come the other one wasn't this good? How come the other one couldn't build off anything beside a novelty? In my personal opinion, and this is just my personal opinion to your critique and kind of like your, just kind of how you've kind of taken it all in. I think a lot of the difference between WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier is the same thing of the difference between the the Civil War or the Winter Soldier and, and Doctor Strange. The, the stakes are so much higher when you're dealing with Sam and Bucky because they don't have the same cachet as Captain America or as Vision or as Scarlet Witch. This It's just more grounded, and I don't mean that in reality. I just mean anytime something happens, there's a bigger impact because it means more in this context of the story, in this universe, because you're not dealing with the mystical. Even though you're dealing with a super serum, you're still dealing with you know people with PTSD and what happens with racism in America and, and kind of trying to do right by your former sins. I think what happens is there's more stakes in Falcon and Winter Soldier in the little ways, not in the big grand scheme of things, because in WandaVision, you're still dealing with world-ending stuff. But what I mean is it's the little moments, and it has nothing to do against, you know, Elizabeth Olsen or Paul Bettany. It just, it's it's different. It, it hits harder. It hits more when it comes to this storyline, in my opinion, and just how we look at it. No, I completely agree. And, like, there's not a lot, this show does so much right and not a lot wrong, honestly. I don't have a lot of complaints with the show. I do think, if I had to say, well, Alex, gun to your head, say a negative. Okay, first episode was kind of slow for 10 minutes, I guess. I really don't have a lot of negatives for the show, and that's impressive for an MCU property where at this point, the MCU is so far into it, you have to look for those things. And, like, you're definitely part of the job is looking for, okay, when are they going to drop the baton? And you see a show like this, and you're like, no, they're breaking records still. They're telling better stories somehow 10 years later. And personally, I have a lot of conversations with people about the show because it has a lot of social satire and a social commentary to it. And personally, I think what I loved about the show is how it it flips your expectations on its head. So again, you know, we from the scene of, of Bucky and Sam getting into that fight on the street and we have the cops show up and it's the white guy who gets arrested. You know, we have Isaiah talking to Sam and... He's basically telling them, like, why you shouldn't be Captain America. Why you shouldn't want to be these things. And he's right. He's validated. He's 100% correct to feel that way. And then the show, could, in a basic show, would leave it like that and say, America bad. This, this, and that. And, like, it would have some truth to it. But the show also says that it's a complex situation because Sam is a good man. He knows the hardship his people, the community are going through. But he also has beliefs. He's a soldier. He's a counselor. And his sister does the opposite of what Isaiah does and makes him say, you're not going to let that man get to your head. That's not who you are. And I think that was so beautiful of this show, to subvert your expectations, to think Sam is just going to be an angry black man. And they didn't do that. It's complex. Isaiah isn't an angry black man. He's a hurt soul. Sarah is a lightning rod for Sam. And I love that about this writing and the show. Man, you took the words right out of my mouth. I love those scenes, and I'll, I'll mention one more as my final opinion. But to build up what you just said, and like like you said, they could have easily just said, he's angry. He doesn't want it. But like to, then I love his nephews and his relationship with them because there's this hopefulness of like, yeah, man, like we can be upset and we could be mad about what happened, but I, I believe I can make a change in this world and make it better and own this and be something, be a symbol. And to see the kids playing with the shit, I'm like, man, like you said, they get it. They're not just saying, be angry, be bitter. They're saying, no, control your destiny. Have your own opinion. And I love that message. My final thoughts go to that final scene with Bucky and Sam saying, when me and Steve handed you the shield, we had no idea what we were doing. We, mm -hmm. we couldn't understand what we were doing to you. And I love that scene because it really goes to show you a vulnerable moment with Captain America, who's not even in the show being so blissfully ignorant to the idea of like, no, we gave you a lot. We didn't even take in consideration what it would do to you and how you would feel about it. And what I love about the whole thing about Cap is that he looms in this series. Like the, the S.H.I.E.L.D., Steve Rogers, Captain America, without ever having to be in the show. That's how important this character is in the arc of the MCU, that he just looms 
over everything in a good and bad way, and I love that. But before we move on, because we're getting to the end of the series, just a shout out, obviously, Sebastian Stan and Anthony Mackie, but Erin Kellyman as Carly, she's been awesome in the series, very believable, and I love she's that. Turning full heel, that's great. I loved it. Shout out to our boy Wyatt Russell. The dude got a lot of crap in the first episode, but I'm going to tell you something right now. This dude knocked it out of the park. He's a gold star, future star in this industry. I've been high on him since that episode of Black Mirror. Uh, I love him as U.S. agent. I love that post credit scene. Uh, Emily. He's been an overlord. I just saw Overlord. He's fantastic in that. So, uh, this dude has a, a huge future in the in- industry. Uh, shout out to Bay Emily Van Camp. She's amazing. Daniel Bro. I cannot wait to see him with the Thunderbolts, and because we got to see Good Brother in an amazing cameo, Julia Louise Dreyfus. Shout out to Northwestern, our girl Elaine Veep is in the MCU. She's going to be making a bad Avengers, right? Yeah, she's going to be making something really fun, like a Bizarro Avengers. It's going to be great, like a government-run Avengers black market. I love her. She's just so. Like, I laugh whatever she says because mm-hmm. she's just naturally funny. Like, it, it amazes me a person can just get on screen, say nonsense in the MCU and still come across as, man, that's original. And finally, just shout out to George St. Pierre, one of our favorite fighters, obviously. Danny Ramirez has been amazing. Adepero Odoye as Sarah, obviously uh, amazing as the sister. And shout out to Florence Kasumba. Is that how you pronounce it, good brother? I don't, you know, I'm horrible at that, but shout out to her. And the how do we pronounce their name from uh, Black Panther? The, they're not the, the Majorie, I think. Uh, what are they called? I, you know what? I can't do it justice and say it properly, so we're going to have to figure that out by the series for now. Because you know what I keep wanting to say is uh, the thing from uh, The Mummy. So I... <laughs> yeah, I I'm going to have to hear it. It's very complicated, so I'm going to have to hear it a few more times. But you talk about putting... But I love their storyline. But you talk about putting over Wakanda. Like, the MCU puts over Wakanda in the most beautiful Undertaker way. I love it. Like, nobody ever gets over on Wakanda. No, Wakanda over everything. Wakanda forever. Good brother, I have loved this series. Uh, what do you think the ending is going to be? Do you think uh, that Sharon Carter is power broker? What do you think we're going to get in this entire thing? No, I don't think she's power broker. I think she'll be something right under it. I think hopefully we get something fun, like a nice swerve. Like, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we're going to give you something fun. I'm looking forward to finally seeing Sam with the shield and the new wings he got from Wakanda. Okay, so do you think he is going to be rocking both the wings and the shield? Do you think it's not going to just be one or the other? Do you think they're going to combine it? And finally, do you think he actually takes the mantle of Captain America? Yes. Good brother. Are you ready to test your might? Always. Because this coming up weekend, we finally get our eyes, our hands, our souls, our spirits. We travel to the nether realm. We have to protect earth realm. Our greatest warriors finally unite for mortal combat. Good brother. Hype level. Let's go. Uh, 10 out of 10. After seeing Kong Godzilla, after the early reviews are great, just like Kong Godzilla. This ain't going to win an Oscar. It's violent. It's bloody. It's fun. It's to set up a franchise. That's all I want. I'm going to stay up late that night. I'm going to watch it right when it premieres. I'm so excited. As people know, fans of the show and new listeners, we are what you would call experts in Mortal Kombat. We have studied the history of the realms and the history of the gods. I, for one, am ready to see Shang Tsao, the Shirai Ryu, or the Lin Kuei. I'm ready to see the legendary Kong Lao. I'm ready to see Goro tear some people apart. Good brother, we've talked about it. It's literally in the archives, our love for Mortal Kombat. Just let's gush a little bit about what you want to see from this movie. Obviously, the reviews have come out, and like you said, it's not going to win any Oscars. It doesn't doesn't have the best writing, but it looks like it has a lot of TLC to it, just like Kong and Godzilla. So, what are you? What do you want when the the, the hour and a half is over? What would be the thing that would just? What is going to be the satisfying moment? Is it going to be the kills, the gores? Is it justifying the characters? Is it a cohesive story? What is it that that you really? when it's all said and done, it's going to be the thing that you think puts it over the top for you. I mean, it's going to be the gore and the violence. And from what I hear, it's going to be the nod to the hardcore audience. And I think that's the issue that video game movies need to start leaning toward. And they did a little with Sonic is the audience. You're trying to reach a weird audience with 
video game movies. And you're better off trying to reach the hardcore video game people and bring in the casual audience than trying to play to the casual audience and then see if the hardcore audience. Like, we found that from World of Warcraft. That when you try to play to a common audience for such a hardcore property, it doesn't work. As we found out from Sonic, where you're a little more, you know, we're going to throw the Easter eggs in for you. We're going to pretend that you're a fan of Sonic when watching. And if you're not, you're going to become one. That works out better. And that's what I hope from this movie. It's, it's, hey, you like Mortal Kombat? This is for you. Hey, you don't know much about it? This is also for you. You're going to love this. It's violent and crazy. With that, good brother, what have you been working on for us? What are we doing next week because of the premiere of Mortal Kombat? So, obviously, we used to have a little show, The Quarantine Files, which we kind of turned into our version of Black Mirror specials. You might get one here and there. You might get one once a year, twice a year, once a month. We don't know. We're going to bring it back for a special Mortal Kombat episode. And knowing the Good Brothers being a month late after March Madness, we're gonna, I'm going to put together a little bit of a bracket from Mortal Kombat 1 through 3 of some of our favorite characters, fan favorites also. And we're going to finally break it down and decide who is the best Mortal Kombat fighter character overall presentation comes. I have a feeling I know where it's going to end between you and me, mm -hmm. but I'm excited to see the journey. So let's take away Sub-Zero and Scorpion for a second for this part of the conversation. Who are you most excited to see get a film adaptation version of them in 2021? Goro. Goro's my man. I love the old school puppy because it was so kooky and crazy and I love Muppets. But man, to see like a real Goro, that's so exciting to me because Goro was the, the, the biggest bad when we were kids. Like he was, oh my God, how am I ever going to defeat that holding that little controller? Not knowing, man, I don't know how I'm going to beat this guy with four arms. So I got two. I want to see if they do Quan Chi. I, I want to see if they actually go there or if that's going to be a sequel type of thing. And I really want to see what they do with Reptile. Yeah, I'm excited for Reptile, I think, because it, it, it's interesting. A lot of people grow up with the ninja reptile. Yeah. But for people like us, he is a reptilian, though, in the lore, in the history. So it's going to be interesting where they're going to fall. I believe he's going to fall more reptilian if I've seen the posters. But I'm, I'm interested to see how people react to that because you have a generation that grew up where he was the secret ninja. But then people like you and me are like, well, no, the lore is he is from a reptilian species that also fights. So I'm torn with what I want to see. But honestly, like, even though you're, you and I are part of the generation of that, his character in the, in the canon kind of just reverted back to his the evolution or more evolution to what they actually look like. Me personally, though, I always thought Reptile is the third ninja. If there's three ninjas in Mortal Kombat, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, and Reptile. There's blue, yellow, and green. And I, I kind of didn't like that it's it, that they kind of went a little bit more sci-fi. And I think a lot of that had to do is because of the world building that they were doing. Uh, I have one more good brother that I'm excited to see, and I haven't seen him yet. I haven't seen any teases of him yet, which means he is definitely a post credit scene. Good brother, we better get Johnny Cage. I was thinking more... Uh, Shao Kahn, but both, yes, I'm very excited for both. I'm so shocked we're not getting Johnny Cage, and I'm interested to see why we're not getting Johnny Cage. Like, that one was a big mystery to me, and I know we added a, a brand new human character, but it fascinates me that we're not getting such a simple character like Johnny Cage, and maybe they are saving it, but like a Green Ranger, Power Rangers thing, mm -hmm. I just hope we definitely get to see a Johnny Cage in the modern time time what well, do you think though that the cole character is just a proxy for scorpion like what's your idea about this character what, what do you think so because okay if you look at the previews it looks like sub-zero and scorpion have a fight scene together but then if you look at some of the other scenes obviously it shows that uh that they're right before the family gets assassinated and I wonder if it's going to be like a time traveling movie or if it's going to be parallel universes or if we're going to be at tournament number 10 because they've already won the nine tournaments. Where do you think we're going to be at timeline wise of this? I think we'll be where Mortal Kombat 1 is where they need to win this 10th tournament. Another oh. realm. Okay, very interesting. So this is it. This is the final one. Who gets the final death blow at the end of this? I think they're going to stick close to the new anime movie we got where it's going to be a mix of Liu Kang and Scorpion. Because I really think you're going to build off those two guys. I think Liu Kang more in the second, but I think you're going to build a heavy on Scorpion. Is this Cole guy going to get put over, and he going to be the final guy to put the death nail on, on Shang Tsao? 
I hope not. I hope he is a whole side thing, like just to be a more human ass part and give us more of that outlook. I would really be disappointed if he has that much of an output. I'd be okay if he's just, no, we just had to add a character and he's your outlook into this. And he's the one from America that makes you feel like you're in the movie. I would appreciate that more than, okay, now he's the one that beats them. Well, then what do we do with our other two champions of Liu Kang and Scorpion? Who dies in this movie? None of the main good guys. Does Kano die? Mm, I don't know. I don't think any of the... I think Reptile dies. Yeah, that, he's a jobber of the stars, though. That doesn't count. I don't think Kano does. I hope not. Kebab might. You think Kebab might, might die? Kebab. You, think, yeah. Kebab. you think Kebab might die? Really? I mean, he is a secondary well, I, character. They're yeah. not keeping both Red Dragons, so I think one of the Red Dragon guys dies. Kano's just a little more popular, but... Cabal definitely has the weapon tree, so I'm interested. I feel like we're going to get a lot of jobbers thrown in this first movie of just like, oh, this guy's in the tournament too, dead. Yeah, they're going to give us like, maybe. Hopefully we get a Baraka. Do we get a Baraka, maybe. you think? Maybe. Yeah, he'll definitely be a jobber to the stars too. And then we're going to get like Serena, the vampire lady, and there's just going to be a bunch of nonsense. And I'm actually really excited about this movie. If anything, it just shows that movies can be fun. And I think the last few weeks of having Godzilla vs. Kong and now this one, and they aren't just hot garbage, just shows that movies should be fun. And not everything needs to be, you know, a Scorsese movie, but not everything should also be Michael Bay. You can have a little bit of everything, and now that we're in Oscar season and we're having some of these fun films, it's a shame that, you know, not everybody, we can't get 120 people in a movie theater, but some people have been able to enjoy Godzilla vs. Kong, and now we're going to be able to enjoy this. Everybody else ordering some pizza, having some barbecue, and watching it on their apps. I think this is a golden age of fun movies and fun streaming. Good Brother, any final thoughts? As we, the next time we'll be talking, we'll officially have watched Mortal Kombat. No, I'm just super excited, and I can't wait. I'm not going to get any sleep this week. Can I be honest with you? I'm a little, I'm a little, I guess the word would be, upset a little sad that by the this time in the weekend next week we, we won't have godzilla versus kong anymore we won't have the snyder cut we won't have mortal kombat anymore like we would have gone through everything we were kind of looking forward to like do you, uh, do you kind of got space jam we do still have space jam but it's definitely not on the same level as the anticipation for these other ones that we've had for the last year and a half two years right and then we'll get a black widow luckily Black Widow, I think, will be in the movie theater, though. So. I think... How uh, wealthy we'll get? Again, but, okay. But you're giving us names of stuff that was always in production we've known of and, and coming down. Godzilla vs. Kong, Mortal Kombat, and, and the Snyder That's Cut. Cool. That these were movies that were going to be in the theaters or weren't in existence or weren't, weren't going to be good or anything. And the fact that, like, we were anticipating them so much and, like, they meant a lot to us. And, like, yeah, we got Loki, but, like, we're going to have a hundred different MCU shows. We're never going to have this first time of Godzilla versus Kong or the first reboot of Mortal Kombat or the Snyder Cut. Like, that was a special time in such a chaotic time in pop culture. I agree, but that just means we're closer to movie theater releases. And like you said, Black Widow will probably be a movie theater movie we see. Now, sadly, I mean, kind of the last bit of news until we go to Alex's Corner as we wrap up this episode of The Good Brothers. We saw what happened with Cinemark and everything that's going on with Cinerama and whatnot. And um, over in California in the Dome, you and I have had this argument back and forth about the, the industry, the movie theater chain. And such a big one, one that is literally a staple, a, a foundation in the mecca of Hollywood. What are your thoughts about that? Kind of where we're at in the industry. I mean, it's going to be a monopoly. Like I said, the theaters will never die. They're going to become monopolized. And you're, you're only going to see big AMCs with uh, cooperation by Disney and Universal and this and this. Like, it just goes to show you that the Hollywood elite, that as much as they love this old theater, they weren't supporting this theater. They weren't always giving to this theater. And, Things like that, yeah. It's almost like a blockbuster. The mom and pop are probably dying out, and you're only going to see these huge multi-billion dollar chain movie theaters exist, and those aren't going to go away. They're only going to get bigger with the depth of these small mom and pop nuanced theaters. I think we might be seeing the day and age, though, of kind of like the old rentals where, you know, the blockbusters and the Hollywood videos were the Walmart and Targets of distribution, but... 
if you want to see an independent film, if you want to see some of these movies that won't end up in an AMC or a Marcus or whatever the case may be, they're going to people who are going to open up that one movie theater that's going to have to drive an hour and a half to go see some of these movies. And I think that's sad. You know, yeah, it's going to be a corporization type of thing, but it's sad. Like, it is the, the death of the purity, if you will, of like, you could just walk to a random movie theater and see any piece of garbage or any Oscar caliber movie. And now it's going to be, there's four Disney movies and two Warner movies. And you just better hope that you like the property they're giving you and that they're not just cash grabs. Agreed, but we might also get to the point where all movies are more available to all people. And that's the hope, that streaming services and that creators and content curators are able to have an outlet and that the industry just evolves and adapts opposed to, you know, dies. And unfortunately, when evolution happens and when these circumstances may just be expedited because of a pandemic... You know, it just becomes one of these where you just hope enough people see the end of it. But good brother, let's head on to your corner. We've had a wonderful episode talking about some fun things. It's been a while since we've been able to deep dive into some of these subjects. But with that, let's jump into your corner before we head out. What have you been watching? What have you been re reviewing? I know you're in love with Invincible. Anything else you have on the docket? What's going on? No, pretty slow week. Uh, Invincible was fantastic. Um, I speak this praise. I think it and Falcon Winter Soldier are the two best shows on TV right now, and I have finally started Shit's Creek after everyone told me for a wonderful show. To watch. Wonderful show. It is so far very joyful. Absolutely, and with that, Alex is getting all the joy from Shit's Creek, and hopefully, you guys have a joyful rest of your weekend and a joyful week coming up. Good brother, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Good Brothers. Please be safe. Take care of uh, all the stuff you have to make sure that you don't get in any trouble because we need to talk about a lot of fun stuff, including a series finale and a premiere on next week's episode of The Good Brothers. But until then, make sure you guys are following us all over the universe. We're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Mike at Media. Instagram, Mike Mercado Media. The Good Brother is on Twitter at Mercado21Alex. And on Instagram, Mercado2121. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Good Brothers Pod. We're all over the universe from Patreon, your favorite podcast network on YouTube at Mercado Airwaves. Check us out at teespring.com slash Mercado Airwaves. And like us on Facebook at Mercado Airwaves. For the good brother himself, Alex Mercado. Finish him. I'm the good brother, Mike Mercado. We will see you next time here on the Good Brothers on the Mercado Airwaves Network. Network. Thanks for joining us here on the Good Brothers here on Mercado Airwaves.